Recently, hobby YouTuber, legend, all-round swell guy, Mr. The Miniac, made a video about Age of Sigma and why he thinks it might be a trash game. In this video, I'd like to respond to that. I'd like to talk to him and also maybe you. If you're a casual gamer or you think games are a little bit overcomplicated and really aren't sure about what you'd like to get from games, this is really the video for you. I'd like to thank Miniac again for making that video because I think it's really brought to light a good conversation about what it's like playing war games. I hope this video helps you and I hope, I hope it's mildly entertaining, at least like a bit. Anyway, let's go. Hello, I'm Rob from The Honest Wargamer. I live stream about wargaming quite a lot. I cover the stats for Age of Sigmar. I travel the world going to live events, live streaming very high-end tournaments. So I'm kind of the person that quite often doesn't really get to talk to casual gamers. In fact, I know that that's true. I know that high-end competitive gaming generally turns people off. They don't like engaging with it because it's difficult and quite often has got a lot of stigma attached to it. Scott actually brought some of those points up in his video and we will cover those later. But initially, I'd just like to say, please give this video a chance. Just listen to my points and if you don't agree, just tell me in the comments why. I want to know why you think what you think and what, how you feel and why you feel what you feel. Let's start with what me and Scott agree on. The rules. The rules should be free. They should be digital and they should be available to everyone. Games Workshop shouldn't put a giant paywall between you and playing with your miniatures, which are already pretty expensive. This is something I've argued for a long time. It's also something pretty much tournament gamers agree on as well. We want to play the game and play with our toys. So specifically for Games Workshop games, I think it's a really fair criticism that Scott brought up. And it's something that I think generally going forward, I'd like to see other war games and other systems not adopt. I think having digitally available free updated rules so that they can balance games so they're more enjoyable for players both at tournaments and casually is better. Balance game system or a game system where you at least dress internal balance issues digitally and quickly is such a good system so that you at home, if you're playing casually, can just have fun with. I also agree with Scott that list writing is challenging, but I would push back on this and this would be the first point that we would start to disagree on as we go through the video. When I first started building Warhammer Army lists, my God, were they difficult. And that's okay because it's kind of a complicated thing to do. It's what the point of this video is gonna be. We're gonna talk about how difficult it is to play war games and whether or not it should be difficult to play war games. I think no game system should be overly complicated. I think that there's a real fine line between too complicated and doesn't have enough options. And there's a load of different systems that operate on either side of that line. For Age of Sigma, for example, I think it's fine. I don't think it's too difficult and you could build the list fairly simply, especially if you're not trying to write perfect tournament lists. You can just start out with something as simple as just a hero and a couple of battle line units. It's pretty easy to do. You don't have to think too much about that. But if you are trying to build tournament lists, that is difficult. I recognize that and Games Workshop should write that down. Instead, I've just written it all down on our website, thehonestwargamer.com. There's a blog there and I'll keep that permanently updated. There's a link in the comments below, so you can always build lists simply and easily. But overall, for all war games, generally building the lists is hard. And the reason for that is, is the game has to have some level of complexity so that you can build something more engaging. It's gonna be another point that I make consistently through this video. The more complicated the system is, kind of the more freedom you have, but that comes with a bunch of pitfalls too. This is the first point where me and Scott completely disagree. He says that the game is full of what he describes as bloat. Bloat is an interesting concept. We could talk about this loads. We could back and forth about this, get into the minutia. But effectively, in my opinion, the way it works is this. The more rules you have, the more options you have. This is really good. And Scott, in fact, backs this up in another point. Scott talks about wanting points for artifacts in the game. The predecessor to Age of Sigmar, Armor Fantasy Battle, had similar categories for the buffs you could give to heroes, but they were all costed. You could give someone a 10 point thing that had a small buff or a 40 point thing that had a larger benefit. Expanding the design space of the game allowed for a richer experience. I actually also agree with that. I really love that idea. Problem is, that's a layered level of complexity. And so I don't really know where you would want to draw the line. And I think everyone's tastes are different 
in that regard. If you look at something like Necromunda, it's wildly complicated. There are so many options, it's overwhelming. I've been trying to get into that game system for a while and I have no idea what to do. So do I feel like you when I embrace something like Necromunda? Absolutely. It seems needlessly complicated. It seems difficult and it's a barrier of entry for me to want to enter the game. However, if you talk to people who are fans of Necromunda, they love how complex it is. They love that they can add all of these different elements to their army. And that's kind of what Scott is talking about here. He wants it so that there's better designed items in the game that cost points. That requires more complexity. So complexity isn't bad, but it is daunting and it is problematic, especially if you don't want to learn them. Kind of the key point of this video as well, in that war games are inherently not fun. The reason for that is you have to study and learn. It's wildly, wildly difficult to learn some of these game systems particularly well. We call this system mastery, and knowing everything about a game system is complicated. It's boring. I can't tell you the amount of times I've sat in a coffee shop or at home reading books or talking with someone in a WhatsApp group about quite how complicated a certain interaction in a rule system is. And I know the next thing you're gonna say is, it shouldn't be like that, Rob. It's not important. You should just be playing and having fun. The thing is, knowing those rules that well can have that fun. Problem is, you need to learn those rules to do so. Brings me on to the next point that Scott makes, which I think is a really fair one, and a point maybe many of you talk about a lot. Scott's talking about words being too wordy. Too verbose. There's just too many words to describe a thing. That makes sense. That's fair. Devil's in the detail, as they say, but in this situation, it's just dull and boring. But that's a kind of quintessential element of war games. Maybe there are other game systems that are more elegant, more well-written, and more refined. Super fair. Maybe Age of Sigmar isn't the most perfect version, although it does have numbered rules, which I think is actually really good, especially for referencing stuff with other people. But that's not the point I think Scott's talking about. Scott says that he thinks that people who know the rules, or more importantly, want the detail in the rules, are a little bit pedantic. But Scott, if GW doesn't do this, people are gonna abuse the game. In my opinion, the core rules should be written for normal people, and the one percenters can deal with the added reading and some other document freely available online if they wanna be annoying pedants. That's where I think I would push back, and I don't think Scott is in any way trying to attack people who know the rules well, but I do think it's something that the casual community have talked about a lot. In Dungeons and Dragons, you can be a fantastic DM. You can know all the stats and all the rules and all the background to every unit and every character in the game. This helps you create these incredible, amazing worlds. I don't know if Matt Mercer is considered to be an incredibly good DM by Dungeons and Dragons people, but he's definitely considered to be a popular one. In music, if you get really good at playing your instruments, then you just thrill crowds and entertain people. Having mastery of those skills is very, very important. If you're doing sports, you become a national hero or a national disgrace, depending. And your team is supported because the players have developed skill sets that work really, really well. However, if you know the rules well for a war game, you get words such as beardy, cheesy, power gamer, and all sorts of other things. And that's always confused me and I'd love to talk about it. The next bit I'm just gonna have to read because I can never remember the quote fully. Mastery is defined as, you have such high levels of focus, knowledge, and experience that you can see the full picture and bend or change the rules to achieve spectacular results. It typically takes at least 10,000 hours of intense practice or about 20 years to attain the required combination of skills, knowledge, and intuition. And I think with wargaming, that's kind of the big conversation. It's always mastery versus fun. We celebrate mastery in painting. Golden Demon is a great example of that. We clap and we like posts and we blog things that we think look incredible by painters that we consider to be at the top of their art. We watch lore videos by masters who know all of the lore. They thrill us with all the stories and deep research that they've done. However, mastery in wargaming is often seen as a problem because somehow it's not fun or it doesn't feel fun to engage with the people who've mastered wargaming. I don't think anyone has necessarily mastered wargaming. As we said, that's 20 years and 10,000 hours. That's a lot. But the conversation I'd like to have is that you don't need to master the rules. You can just master having fun. And that is kind of the key point of this video and everything I talk about with wargaming. There are people around the world who know their rules intimately well, but also more importantly, they know the strategy and the tactics to apply those rules and win tournaments. But there are also people who know how to have fun on the tabletop. And they've worked very hard at mastering those skill sets too. And also they're not separate. It's something that gets discussed a lot. People think that they're separate and they aren't and they don't need to be. Also, much like music, 
You practice chords, eventually you can start jamming with your friends. You make more and more complicated music, and you have fun because it's just wicked. It's also true for rules in Age of Sigmar and also other war games. More complicated the rules, more often times there's more opportunity to do some really fun stuff. I'll give you an example of a recent Age of Sigmar tournament list that did really well. And you tell me whether or not you think this is fun. It's a Claw Lord, which is a Skaven Rat, and he's been given the ability to cast a spell by taking an artifact. That's already a lot. You need to know where the artifacts are, you need to know that you can kind of change what is a normal rat into a wizard. Then you've given him a flaming weapon. There's another rat called a vermin lord that's given him this blood ability so that if he ever gets killed he can fight when he dies. Then there's another rat who's cast a boat. This is a boat from the underworld that transports that rat forward. The rat gets out the boat with his flaming sword, runs into a mega gargan, which is a giant much bigger, attacks the giant, doesn't completely kill him. The giant then stomps on him, and before he dies, his soul gets out of his body and murders the giant because the vermin lord did that before. You can't tell me that that's not a cool story. You can't tell me that that's not wicked, but it requires a series of complex rules to make happen. Complexity is just the element that you need to make fun like that occur. But that doesn't help casual gamers because if you're a casual gamer, you maybe don't want to learn that amount of information. And that's okay too. Having verbose rules that are specific allows those interactions to happen, but also stops other interactions that would be really boring. And that's what's cool about living rule sets or things that change all the time, is because you can find problems with rules and you can change them and make them tighter so that those exploits or other things don't happen. I know you're about to say, Rob, that's all power gamers are. People are exploiting the rules. It's just people who know the rules well. And interestingly, especially in Age of Sigmar's case, a lot of those tournament gamers are people who are on advisory boards helping the system designers from stopping those interactions happening because who else is going to do it? It has to be the people who know the rules. Should there be simplified rules for pushing minis around so you can just have fun? Yes. Is knowing the rules well and playing at a high level not fun? Absolutely not. It's never been my experience. I've seen people just having great times everywhere. And so the one bit I don't like about what Scott said, like everything else is definitely worth a discussion, is that people who know the rules are pedants. I think it's a good thing to know the rules. You've developed system mastery. And I would like it, if you get the chance, the next time you find people who know rules well, respect the fact that they do. Because they'll also respect the fact that you just want to have a good time. Okay, to summarize this part of the video, being a casual gamer is so valid. Like, I want you to play games. I want you to have fun, and I don't want you to have to learn loads of complicated rules to do so. And I think a large part of that is to do with game design, but also a large part of that is to do with you. I know for a fact lots and lots of people who rule, know the rules really well have learned also how to have fun on the tabletop. I've had to learn that. And they'll talk about that when we get to the dice rolling part in the future. It's just one of those things that requires a lot of practice because it does. And I think Scott would agree with me there. He obviously has put a lot of time into painting. He's an incredible painter. And people have learned lots from his painting videos and also how to have fun painting, which I think is a really valuable experience. But you also have to put effort into having fun playing games. Something you have to kind of turn up to want to do. So if you do want to play games casually, just don't care about winning as much. Just take some stuff, move it around, high five your friends and clap. That's great, that's so valid. I would love to do that with you. That sounds fun. Just hanging out with some people, wanting to enjoy themselves. Sounds like a great time. But knowing the rules well and engaging with those rules well is also really, really fun. And if you ever wanna get on that journey, I'd love you to come and hang out with me as me and other people do that because it's really fun to do that too. The next point Scott makes about Age of Sigmar specifically is a fair one, but also there's lots to talk about with this as well because it touches on most war games and game systems. Internal balance, so that's all the units that are usable, is not always equal. Basically, some units aren't very good. First off, if you're just playing casually, that doesn't really matter. That's not meant to be rude, and I've really, really struggled and wrestled with this, so I really hope you can hear this and not just think that I'm trying to be a little bit over the top. Analyzing what units are good takes huge amounts of data and time, and as someone that does this for a living, I don't even know if I know. I talk to tournament gamers all the time all the time. I watch the games, I listen to them talk about lists, I play them myself, and even I get stuff wrong. I get stuff right, I get stuff medium, and guess what, so does the player base. That's kind of what's electric about tournament gaming, is that there's never really necessarily a solved game state. There's loads of units that are very good, arguably too good, but 
there's always someone doing something tricksy here or there. And actually, that's what makes the game so exciting. It's that kind of like uncovering a secret and then being able to use it for the first time is really engaging. Internal balance is definitely an issue in Age of Sigmar, as it is with every other game. If you're committed to playing casually, you're like me with painting. You're committed to doing what you enjoy at the amount of time and mental resource that you're willing to put into it. I don't want to learn how to paint super well. I want to slap chop stuff. I don't know if you've watched my video. And that's okay. Some people will say you should learn how to edge highlight or wet blend or any of those other things. But I don't really want to. I just want to slap chop some minis and put them on the tabletop. Similarly, I think that some of you don't necessarily want to play at the level that tournament gamers do. And let's compare them to professional painters. And that's very okay too. We're the same. We just have different mediums to express the things that we truly enjoy. An internal balance shouldn't necessarily affect you if you're of that mindset. Similarly, the type of paints I use don't really affect me. I don't know which paints flow better or generally work well because it's not something I think about. And it's also not something I care about. And that's okay. For tournament gamers or just people who like to play match play games, just at the club or hanging out with their buds, because there aren't loads of people who love to do that, internal balance can be an issue. It can create something quite exciting the meta game, where you have a rock, paper, scissors mechanic between all the different armies. Armies normally devolve into list archetypes, which I've been trying to cover on our masterclass series on YouTube. And those archetypes change, rotate, go into fashion, come out of fashion. Some armies are so good, but almost no one plays them. Some armies aren't very good and loads of people play them. So not only is there a internal balance, there's an external balance issue as well between these armies. And I don't think that there's any game that avoids that. It's not true for Magic, it's not true for League, it's not true for any of the tabletop games. And that ongoing continual meta is quite fun to engage with but difficult to keep up with. And why would you want to if you just want to have a couple of friends over and just play a couple of games? But that rotation system is exciting. It's a fun treadmill to be on. The problem with Games Workshop's ones is a very expensive treadmill. It costs a lot of money and it's difficult to be a part of and keep up with. And I would find this exhausting. I don't keep up with several war games because that treadmill is just too much for me to take on mentally. So if you are only engaging with one game system and don't even want to keep up with it, that's got to be very daunting. I'm not sure what the answer is. It's in all the other game systems and it's quite good in Age of Sigma right now. Could it be better? Yes. Will I advocate for it to be better all the time? Absolutely. The next point Scott makes is about flat gameplay. Because the table's flat. I think that's what he's talking about. It's like a flat the surface. The thing about Age of Sigma and 40k and many other war games are in the title really. It's a war game. It's not a D&D &D adventure. It's not a romp around the realms, which it sounds like a great title for a book actually. We should, we should write that, the romp around the realms. A war game feels a lot like it should be about killing stuff and holding stuff and capturing stuff and stealing stuff and I'm English so definitely nicking stuff. But conquering land and destroying your enemy feels like what you're meant to do in a war. It's what I like about Age of Sigmar or Warhammer Fantasy Battles or any of those other games, is I felt like a general commanding my forces and moving them around the board, the strategy, the skill, the tactics. Games Workshop actually added something new in third edition Age of Sigmar called Battle Tactics. This is like a quest or a mission you get at the beginning of each of your turns. In fact, you choose them, which is kind of cool, adds to the strategy, I'm gonna do this battle tactic. There are 12 battle tactics in the General's Handbook, which is kind of the six monthly publication that you get for playing the game at match play. There are just core battle tactics, which are actually really good and pretty fun for playing casual games. I like these. I think this actually doesn't make the game flat and actually makes it very dynamic. You can strategize out through the course of the game what battle tactics you plan on doing, which is quite cool. You can turn up with kind of a battle plan and then it obviously won't go your way. Or you can kind of react on the fly and just be like, oh, this is available now and I'm gonna do this mission. I really like these because it does what I think a game should be, especially a war game. I should be trying to get stuff, conquer lands, or I should be trying to murder people. I mean, or maybe I guess, yeah, murder them. Yeah, we're trying to murder them. It's a war game. To quote Conan, but if you are looking for a little bit more, Games Workshop have added into the battle tomes some kind of different battle tactics, which are very thematic with the army. This reinforces my point from earlier. Added complexity, like these, add flavor to the game. They add a way to score points that aren't necessarily what you would necessarily think from a war game. And this added complexity is something that I think people really enjoy. It's thematic, it's story driven, it's much more engaging. You can do things like be Zinch, magical bird army, and you can cast spells and then you will get points. I actually don't necessarily like these in the core war game. I would like to see something much simpler, kill the enemy general, 
defeat a battle line unit, slay a monster. Some of these are like, get two points for getting in and out of a boat for carriage and overlords. It's definitely got more dynamic gaming. You're doing more things which aren't, as Scott says, just holding something or killing something. But also, I don't know why in a war, I get two points for getting in a boat. Unless it's Dunkirk, I guess, that worked. There's already a great conversation in the Age of Sigmar community about the balance of these, that additional and added complexity, which is what Scott was looking for, is actually making the game a little bit problematic. And this brings me on to another amazing point about playing tabletop games, which is gonna lead really nicely into the dice rolling conversation we're gonna have. The war game is based on story. Everything has a story, it has something that it's doing. And so while you're playing a mechanical game, there is, of course, an underlying narrative to the game that you're playing itself and the narrative of those units. This adds something really exciting to the game, which I think never makes it flat. Units get special rules for being able to be fast, like run and charge. Other units can teleport or cast spells better. You need added complexity in the game to really express what those narratives are on those units. Otherwise, everything becomes quite bland and flat because you're just saying these guys are just a spearman. But no, magical spearmen are different to ghostly spearmen. And I like that the rules have the ability to express that on the tabletop. Age of Sigmar 3 also added even more to the gameplay over Age of Sigmar 2. They added actions and reactions like we deploy. So if you get close to the enemy, they're just gonna run away, which is kind of cool, but it's CP dependent or command point dependent. So now you're doing resource management while also working out the strategy of the game. This has added more of a you go, I go element to the game, which I think is really fun. And it's increased the skill cap or how much skill expression you can show on the tabletop, which is also cool. They also added things like monstrous actions, which I think are quite fun, where a monster can do something like raw so a unit can't hear the commands from their general and use a command ability. I like those added rules because those added rules have increased the quality of the gameplay. What they've done is they've added the narrative to the game through rules. Gameplay is like free form jazz. There we go, I've got it, I've nailed it now. This is, I've done like 19 of these takes, go with me. You have to learn your instrument incredibly well to go and jam out at a jazz session. I think it's called jamming out, I'm not sure. You have to learn how to utilize those tools, musical instruments, in order to be able to play and express yourself. It's a free form of expression. Playing games is a form of expression. They're expressing themselves on the tabletop by understanding how the game plays. If you don't learn how the game plays well, it will seem flat because you do not have the expertise, knowledge, experience, or ability to see how to make it dynamic. That seems obvious and also it feels reductive because what you're telling me, I don't know the rules well, so the game feels flat. Like, yeah, but I don't mean that bad. I don't mean you're terrible. I just mean you can learn to jazz, man. <laughs> Jazz, just jazz it out. Jazz, please, jazz. Don't jazz, don't jazz on me, jazz with me. Okay, the next bit Scott talks about is dice rolling. I'm not sure why you would want to get away from dice. Dice are kind of the fun in Age of Sigmar, Wargaming, Warhammer, or any of those things. Scott and me spoke about this, obviously, in the interview, and one of the things he talked about was that he wanted the results to be more flat. He didn't want quite as many spikes and drops in the dice rolls. So D6 game. Something that happens on a two plus will fail one sixth of the time. Dice rolls feel like the quintessential element of these war games. I don't want to roll 200 dice. I want to be super clear about that. I don't want to roll loads and loads of dice. But also I do want to roll some dice and I want those results to be quite different. I want to be able to know how to manipulate those dice so that they become more reliable. That feels like that's part of list writing and also the skill sets in play in the game. Putting buffs and auras and all those other things so a unit is more reliably going to do the thing I expect it to do is great. But also I like that there's a random chance that stuff doesn't do the things it's meant to do because that's what makes the story. You don't ever really talk about the unit that rolled the average dice. It's just not something that happens. But Similarly, you always talk about the time you rolled a double six on a charge and it won the game. Little side note, tip of the day, if you don't want your opponent to roll two sixes and charge you, don't be inside 12 inches. <laughs> so it's like, I happened to be once. My opponent rolled two 12s, won the game, and I was like, I will never be that close again. That's part of learning, right? I was salty that day. I just want to be clear. I was, what the, this is so unlikely. But it is likely, okay? It's not impossible, and I like that. The non-linear nature of it not being impossible makes the game have highs and lows. And what are we here for? Surely to have fun. 
and those elements, you can't have highs without lows. I don't know how you build that into a game system. The more flat you make the dice rolls, the more flat the game will be. You could use cards, but then just play Magic the Gathering. You could use tokens, then I, I, don't, know, I don't want to do with tokens. Also, Games Workshop have put this into their player code. They've said complaining about dice is something you shouldn't do. There's a general table etiquette to make sure you don't complain about dice. It's pretty much seen as bad form to be complaining about your dice. But I think it's something that happens a lot to people who are new to wargaming or don't play lots of wargaming. Competitive Smash, <laughs> I know, you weren't expecting that. No Johns. Has this thing in it called No Johns, where you don't really complain about your luck because it's seen as bad form. Top table etiquette is to not be talking about your dice rolls in a negative way. In fact, actually, lots of people I know have started to like high five each other on dice rolls or even wish their opponents good luck. Maybe this is a uniquely competitively age Sigma thing. I'm not sure, but it's something I've experienced a lot and I've really enjoyed. I will tell you when I started playing age Sigma or war games generally, I was salty about the dice rolls, but I worked out a system for me that helped me. And a lot of it had to do with my own mindset and nothing to do with the game system itself. Whenever I used to use units, that worked really well on a two up. So a unit that let's say had a two up armor save. Every time I rolled a one, it felt like God himself had entered the room to curse me. But of course, that isn't what happened. It's just one in six times you roll a two. And sometimes you have five dice and you roll five ones. Is the math on that impossible? No, so it can happen. So how did I change my mindset? I just started building armies and units that did successful things on sixes. Instead of thinking about something negative happening on a one, I started to enjoy the game by finding things that work successfully on a six. I love playing orcs and they have a ballistic seal of five. So that means I only hit stuff on fives and sixes. But let me tell you, it feels wicked to roll loads on fives and sixes versus missing loads of space marine shots on ones and twos. And that's just something I had to learn for myself personally. And hopefully that's something you can walk away with and learn from too. Do I still get salty? when I roll badly. Every day, man. That's like a devil you can never, ever chase away. But the dice are such an engaging element of the game that when I do roll well, I know it's because I'm gonna roll badly another time. And I wouldn't want that swing to go away because it's fun. My opponents are having fun, I'm having fun. And I think it's just something you need to embrace about the game. It's kind of cool. And that brings us into the spiciest part about Age of Sigmar and the bit that makes the game the best, the priority roll. Before we talk about anything else, let's look at what Scott had to say about the priority roll. Now, I'm not here to talk about whether or not rolling for priority is a good or bad mechanic. It's literally the worst part about Age of Sigmar. Do people win games because they win the priority roll and specifically get a double turn? Yes. Do people lose games because they don't? Also, yes. Do people lose even when they get the double turn? Loads, absolutely loads. I promise you, there's probably no one in the world who's watched more Age of Sigmar games than me. It happens all the time. Do I have stats for this? Sadly not. I hate anecdotal stories, and so this is a little bit sad that I don't have those to back them up, but it's just not something anyone tracks. But I promise you, there's a really easy way of working out where someone is in the Age of Sigmar journey as a player with how they play on those first few turns. This is pretty much what I always see new players do. Number one, they give the first turn away. This means their opponent has to move around and then they throw everything in and they try and get the double. Because what an incredible strategy. Take two turns, win. What if I was to tell you there's just a counter strategy, which is then stage two of the Age of Sigmar journey, where you just put up some screens, your opponent charges you, gets the double turn, doesn't really do much, and your counter punch is devastating. Now let's get to phase three, where you're being clever and knowing that that's a mistake that you've made several times, just yeeting it all in, you decide to be slightly defensive and then make it so that you're not engaging. Your opponent then, who has played more in a stage four or five of the game, then just gives you the second turn. And now you're in a position where you haven't been aggressive enough. Welcome to the dynamic game state that is Age of Sigmar and the priority role. Let's talk about Yugo Igo games like 40K. The priority role, more than anything else, gives diversity to game state. That's the key element that you have to talk about. Here's a picture. On the left, you can see a game that's Yugo Igo like 40K. It's wildly linear with only two outcomes, really. On the right, you can see what an Age of Sigmar game state looks like. It just has more permutations and possibilities. Number one, this is actually really good for just replaying games. Each priority roll is producing a new potential set of outcomes. And then the priority roll after that is doing another. Does the priority roll make the game less fun? If you're playing casually, I think probably it does. Does it make the game worse? Age of Sigmar has exploded as a game over the past several years. This year, we had the largest Age of Sigmar event in CanCon, Australia. And then a week later, we had the world's largest event again, 
record breaking at the LVO. Are all of these players and all of these new players just putting up with a mechanic that's bad? I don't think so. It's just a mechanic that's really, really bad for new players and casual players. It feels daunting, especially when I show this picture again. Each turn is kind of setting up for a myriad of possibilities that can occur later in the game. But I much prefer that. In fact, I would much prefer it if we had even more priorities. If we had something like Star Wars Legion, where we have unit by units go, that would be super cool. I would love to see that in 40K. I think linear game states are dull. I think the more variety and variabilities you have in a game state means that you have more options as a player and you feel like you have more control in the game. And this is the best bit about the priority role mechanic. The priority role is a mechanic that you use to be better at the game to understand the flow and the state of that frankly stupid picture that I put up earlier. However, obviously, you can't have a balanced game with it. It doesn't possibly work and no one could ever use it, as Scott says. Obviously, saying a double turn was the entire reason someone won is ridiculous, but how much of a contributing factor is it? The largest contributing factor to Age of Sigmar is skill. It's not the priority role. Otherwise, random people would win events all the time. They don't. It's the same players normally featuring in national teams performing consistently all across the world. They use different armies, they use different skill sets, and they perform in different metas. And the priority role is a tool that they understand and use, not one that uses them. Well, of course, Rob, they're just power gamers. Here's an interview I did with Noah, who won the LVO in 2023. The world's largest Age of Sigmar event, probably one of the most competitive you're likely to get, and this is what he had to say about playing games. That my goal is not to win the ITC, not to, you know, do any of that. that that's great if it happens or not, but um, the goal is to make five new friends. The prior role also does something Scott wanted, which is add more dynamic gameplay. For instance, if you go second in a turn, you get more command points than going first. So you have a resource advantage, but you don't necessarily have a tempo advantage. There are battle plans, like the Prize of Galette, for example, where if you go second, you get to choose one of the active objectives. So you now control the board state more, which is interesting, but again, you don't have the tempo in the turn. This creates a more dynamic game and a game with more options and not a flatter game. The prior role isn't bad, it's just divisive. And it's divisive because people haven't engaged with it. But the people who have engaged with it are going to tournaments a lot. They're building clubs, they're having fun, and they're just enjoying themselves. And I want you to know this, I'm still gonna be salty about the next priority role. <laughs> One thing I'll say about the priority role, which is also important, is you learn to lose more and you learn to lose better. Every turn, I have to put the fate of the game in my hands and roll a priority roll. Now, if you're playing really, really well, you should be trying to win a priority roll and give the turn away. It's always good. Well, it's not always good, but it kind of works. I'm making too many points now and I'm talking too long. So to conclude, does this make Age of Sigmar a bad game? I would definitely say that the paywall is hugely problematic. I think that's a really sad element of this and it's not one I can defend or even want to defend. I'm with Scott on this and I will continue to be so. But the game mechanics themselves are really fun. The universe, lore-wise, is becoming more rich and more diverse, which is awesome. I hope the main takeaway from this video is the conversation that being casual and playing games casually is super okay, and something I want to encourage more for people who are time poor who want to engage with a game that way. But also playing games really well at a high value requires a lot of time, effort, and skill. It's just boring. You just have to learn. I mean, it's not boring because it's really exciting. You just kind of have to want to be thrilled by rules and interactions and doing things. Age of Sigmar is a great game, as are all war games. The rules bring story to life on the tabletop, and then the dice help us tell that story. That's true for all war games. It's not really just Age of Sigmar that's good because of those elements. Are they done really well in Age of Sigmar? I think they're done pretty well. But ultimately, I think Scott's video and also this video are about who we are as war gamers individually and what you want out of a war game. I know what I want to do is I want to have fun and I want to play games well. Playing games well requires me to study and learn and practice. Is that boring and dull sometimes? Yes. Does that mean that there's a skill disparity between me and someone else? Yeah. Definitely. Does that mean that I have to ruffle stomp them? No. I'll just use what I know about the game to make the games that I'm playing with someone more engaging. Because that's kind of the point in having great skills at something. One of the things that we can all learn from Scott is how to paint better. We can learn how to paint well, and we can learn how to paint probably with more joy. One of the things we can learn from gamers is how to play well, how to enjoy yourself, and how to express yourself on the tabletop well. This has been a bit of a ramble, I know, but I hope it's been helpful. Because really what I wanted to do in this video. Guess what? It sucks to suck. But you can control that. If you don't want to be bad at the game, practice and learn. 
If you want to be chill, have fun and enjoy yourself, do that. But guess what? You can be chill, have fun, and also learn how to be really good at the game. People at tournaments, or dare I say, because I haven't said it yet in the video, competitive players are enjoying themselves. And they're enjoying themselves because they know what they're doing. That's the bit I've needed to leave right till the end, so as to hopefully not disenfranchise anyone in the video. You have to practice and learn to use any tool. And Age of Sigmar just has loads of different tools. Dice, strategy, units, and rules. Listen, I just want you to have fun playing games. But there's always a fear, like when you learn any skill, it's going to be too difficult or you maybe can't do it. That's something I've worried about a lot when I've played games. It's daunting, like it's complicated, and it seems very easy to blame the tools, like the game, for being the cause of those problems. And some games are bad, sure, but I don't think Age of Sigmar is bad. And I think most of the games are probably not bad. I think the thing I've learned in my life playing games is to engage better with the game, study more, learn more, practice more, and I've enjoyed those games more. Or I've just gone with a more carefree attitude because winning hasn't been the point because I've never really given myself the opportunity to win. I love Total War. I haven't mentioned that yet. I love it. I must have played hundreds of hours of Total War. Am I good at it? No. Have I ever tried to be good at it? Also, no. Should I win the World Championships of Total War? Also, no. Do I think that's unfair? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, come on. I just want to be the world champion. But I've never set myself up to do so. But I've always played those games having a great time because I've made having fun the focus. I hope this video has helped in some way. I hope it wasn't too preachy and lame and boring. But people having fun means a lot to me. Scott having fun means a lot to me. And I hope you all enjoy gaming in the future. This is normally where I'd say I've got a Patreon. You know, support me there. But in this particular video, I'd like you to just go out and support your friends. I'd like you to go and play games with a more fun attitude and try and just enjoy yourself not bemoan the dice and not worry too much about the result because ultimately you've got to give yourself the opportunity to do well. And if you're not doing that, then fun should be your focus. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Thanks for listening. And I'd love to read your comments because I'm sure there'll be fucking loads of them. I'll see you soon.